just to confirm, brother, you can see my screen well. Huh? Yes. All right, tonight we are sharing on the topic of learning. And I'd like to begin by sharing a nice photo with you. This is the library of the University of Leuven. Leuven is a small little historic town about maybe an hour or more by train from Brussels. And when I was last there with my daughter, I took the train to specifically visit this very small historic town. Um, it's a beautiful medieval town. And what you see in that picture is the University of Leuven main library. Now, to the great credit of the people of Leuven, this library was completely destroyed in the First World War. So they rebuilt it as it stands. And during the Second World War, it was again destroyed, bombed to nothing. And they again rebuilt it back to its exacting standards. And the entire building is just a library. And as you go up the library, up the grand stairway, and this is the grand stairway which connects the various floors of the library. On one of the landings of the of this grand stairway as you go up, you see this Buddha image right at the corner. So the grand stairway will go up like that and then like that. And so generations of students had actually walked past this Buddha image. And so you might find it very interesting that you have a big Buddha image placed right at the heart of the university. I hope the people who walk up and down the libraries that grand stairway knows what this image represents. The wisdom, the compassion, the virtues, the values that are inherent in this image of the Buddha representing him at the moment of enlightenment. Because when you get an education, when you learn and you acquire wisdom and knowledge, you are literally enlightened. Now, I like this saying, by three methods, we acquire wisdom. First, by reflection, which is the noblest. So for example, we can learn, we can acquire this wisdom by reflection, in meditation, in discussion, in classes, in deep contemplation. And second, by imitation, which is the easiest, because by imitation, we see friends, we see teachers, we see people who are better than us, and we imitate their lifestyle. We imitate their behavior. We imitate their ability to let go, their ability of mastering the art of doing nothing, and we learn from them to be happy. And finally, by experience, which is the bitterest. Many a times we learn the harsh lessons of life by direct experience. And as I said, one of the probably most important lessons in life is when I conduct a funeral or attend the funeral of someone whom we are close to or care for. And that direct experience of the pain of losing someone is a lesson that no one can forget. And a lesson right at the very core of the Buddha Dharma teaching us about impermanence, about dissatisfaction, and non-self. So we actually utilize all these three methods to acquire wisdom. And this is the latest book, which my little group in Johor Bahru had undertaken to publish. And we are already distributing it all over. You can get copies of it from our representatives in the various states. 
And it basically is a small, tiny handbook in which is encapsulated the wisdom of the Buddha Dharma. And here I want to read you a short passage. The book is 300 over pages of just this. All right. Very colorful, picture Who to follow? Anguttara Nikaya 326. People are brought low by mixing with the lowly. So don't forget that by imitation, you can either imitate up or tragically, you may also imitate down. So people are brought low by mixing with the lowly. By mixing with equals, they are never brought down. So at the very least, mix with your Kayana Mitas who are your equals. By inclining to the best, they quickly rise up. You can associate yourself with the very best. You will very quickly improve and rise by merely imitation. Therefore, they should mix with those better than themselves. Anguttara Nikaya 3.26. So when we learn, these are the ways in which we can learn. Reflection is very important. So whether it is a deep discussion, contemplation by yourself, or reflection in meditation, or by merely imitating the Buddha, when we prostrate in front of the Buddha image, we're actually prostrating to the virtues, the compassion, the wisdom, and all that is good that is represented by that Buddha image. And finally, all of us will experience good things, not so good things, happy things, and sad things. And every one of these experiences can teach us many lessons. And some lessons, well learned, but it can come at a very high emotional cost, where we directly see Dukkha, Anicca, and Anatta. So, Learning the Buddha's wisdom is never something blind, never. This is from the last chapter of the Avantasaka Sutra, a really huge, thick book. And this is just a line taken from the very last chapter. And it says, O Bishus and the wise, just as a goldsmith tests his gold by rubbing, by burning, cutting, rubbing. So you must examine my words and accept them, but not merely out of reverence. The Buddha did not want us to commit intellectual suicide. He wanted us to use our intellect, to use our wisdom, and to actually examine all that he teaches us. Examine it very carefully. When you trade in your gold at the goldsmith, he will examine that gold very carefully to make sure he is not conned, to make sure he is giving you what is worth that piece that you are trading in. So he will do all kinds of tests to make sure that it is real gold. So similarly, we must look at the Dhamma and not accept anything blindly, but to examine it. And when it is true to experience, verified by ourselves, consistent with science, consistent with the wisdom, then we accept it. So is this something new, you may wonder? No, there's actually nothing new in this, because even in the suttas, it was recorded that there was once Venerable Sariputta, the wisest of the Buddha's disciples, was listening to the Buddha teaching the Dhamma. And at the end, the Buddha asked Venerable Sariputta whether he believed this teaching. Now, Venerable Sariputta replied that he does not yet believe it. This is a very important statement. Now, any other teacher 
may have thrown Venerable Sariputta out of the class for such insolence or disrespect. Instead, the Buddha, in his great wisdom, praised the Venerable Sariputta. He was actually speaking the truth, as he has not yet developed his own experiential understanding. Now, while the reply may appear rude, but he wasn't. He was speaking the truth. And the Buddha praised him for it and his approach to learning that a wise person doesn't readily believe. He should consider first before believing. And this, I think, is a very important lesson to us on not, in fact, never committing intellectual suicide. And if there is one thing I hope the Sakya In Dharma School will teach the children, and that is to always question why? Always ask why and never ever commit intellectual suicide. Faith or sadda in Buddhism is not the same as the faith of other religions. Sadda is actually closer to confidence. Confidence that you have verified and you know <coughs> that this is true. It is not the blind faith. In contrast to other religions, we do not walk in faith. We walk in the wisdom of the Buddha Dharma. The wisdom of the Buddha Dharma. Never blind faith. And in fact, in one of the verses in the Dhammapada, this is clearly pointed out. <coughs> So the principle that Sariputta demonstrated is that the student of the Buddha Dharma is in agreement, not because of faith in the Buddha, but because he or she clearly sees for oneself that what is taught is in fact true. So there's a huge difference between faith and your own verification. If I tell Sister Hui Shang, that you've got 10 fingers and 10 toes. And Sister Hui Shan believes in me without ever seeing her hands and her feet. That is fate. But that is inadequate. The Buddha wants us to actually look at your hands and look at your feet. And once Sister Hui Shan had looked at her hands and her feet, and she could see that she indeed has 10 fingers and 10 toes. There is no need to have faith in me. Now she has confidence in what I just told her. That confidence is born out of verification by yourself, by reflection, by contemplation, by experience. Ehipasiko means you come and experience it and see it for yourself. So for those of you who are running Dhamma school for children or teaching the young, or even the not so young, I think it is most important that we must realize never ever to commit intellectual suicide. You always use your mind, your wisdom, your common sense. So the Buddha as a teacher, did he ever scold people when he was a teacher 2,600 years ago? Are there records of the Buddha actually scolding people? Well, there are actually many such records in the Nikayas. And in one particular one, was when a venerable, ironically named Sati, went around telling people that it is consciousness that transmigrate from point A of a person to another life, point B, to then another life, point C. Now, this is actually the standard teaching of that era before the Buddha. 
And the Buddha actually clearly pointed out that consciousness is not something solid that transmigrates from point or life A to life B to life C. Consciousness is as impermanent, changing as anything else in the five khandhas, the five aggregates. The consciousness is like a stream of water. It is not a thing that transmigrates. And this is certainly not something the Buddha taught. And even today, we also have this very common misconception. A lot of people even today think that it is the consciousness that moves like a computer chip that has been taken out and put into another computer, and then after that taken out and put into another computer. That is far from what the Buddha taught. So this venerable sati went around telling people this. And the Buddha was informed by the other disciples that venerable sati is teaching something that you did not teach and then saying that you did. So the Buddha called venerable sati and questioned him and actually asked him, is this what you taught? And says, I understand the Dhamma taught by the Blessed One. It is just this consciousness that runs and wanders on, not another. To which the Buddha replied, which consciousness, Sati, is that? And Sati replied, this speaker, this knower, this that is sensitive here and there to the ripening of good and bad or evil actions. Now, as you read this, you realize that even today, many people still teach this despite this being clearly pointed out by the Buddha as incorrect. And the Buddha scolded him, and to whom worthless man do you understand me to have taught the Dhamma like that? Haven't I in many ways said of dependently co-arisen consciousness? Apart from a requisite condition, there is no coming into play of consciousness. Consciousness is as changeable, as fluid, as anyone else of the other five khandhas. So the point here, of course, that I'm pointing to, out to us, that I'm sharing with all of us, is that when we learn, there must be discipline. And sometimes even that discipline has to be enforced and sometimes shown to us in ways that might sound harsh, but it's actually needed. Sister Li Ming, a few weeks ago, sent me a lovely photo. Not the same photo, but a photo, something like that. It was on the celebration of the Bodhisattva's birthday, apparently. And so she sent me a lovely photo. I could not use that photo because the resolution is a bit low. But basically, it showed the thousand arms and the heads. And so I asked Sister Li Ming. I said, Sister Li Ming, that's a beautiful photo you sent me. But I want to ask you, do you notice anything about the head? Which she did not. And so I pointed it out to her. I said that there are 10 heads here, the top of which is the Buddha. But there are 10 heads here. And if you look carefully in an enlarged picture, you will see that one of the heads is always a very fierce looking head. So of course you know that this imagery represents the bodhisattva of compassion, of unconditional love and compassion with a thousand arms and many, many eyes all reaching out. But one of these 10 heads, you will see, is the head of a rather fierce looking man. Why is it so? I asked Sister Lumi. And that is because in this iconography, even if you want to be the most compassionate person, the most loving person, very often in circumstances, 
you need to be stern. You need to stand your ground. You may even need to scold. All right. Now, I want to share with you now a very nice video. I hope you pay attention to this video because our learning begins, of course, with us practicing the precepts, holding on to these training guidelines, which we all recited and took just now. So what are precepts? They are the basic foundation of our learning. Precepts are not commandments. Far from it, there are no commandments in Bhagavad Precepts are simple guidelines. These guidelines help us who are unenlightened to make decisions whether to do or not do things. When we are undecided, when we are at a crossroad, they are like guidelines, traffic lights, they are like lampposts which help us make decisions, right or wrong. So these are like traffic lights. If we dash across a red light, well, certainly you have a very, very high chance of getting into trouble. But again, I point out, they are guidelines, they are sikapadam, they are training guidelines. They are not commandments. If I have a heart attack and I'm in an ambulance, I certainly hope that ambulance will go wee woo wee woo wee woo and go past the traffic light. Because that situation, that condition demands it. But as a whole, they are good guidelines, humanistic values teaching us. We learn by following these guidelines. We learn to do what is good, what is wholesome with these guidelines as paga offenses to stop us if we are ever tempted to go overboard. So please look at this video. It's an excellent educational video. जरूरत थी छोरे से इतना गुस्सा करने की जरा सी बात तो थी दस रुपए के लिए छोरे ने भूखा मारेगी क्या ऐसा क्या कर दिया इसने जो प्लेट उठा के ले जा रही है दस रुपए तो लिए थे तेरे पर्स से कोई पड़ोस से तो ना लाया था मेरे पैसे लिए थे इसने तेरे बाप के नहीं छोटे घर की है ना तेरी मां ने कुछ तुझे सिखाया नहीं है जान दे ये तो तुझे खाना देगी ना तू मेरी प्लेट से खा ले तो अपने खाने की चिंता कर इसने दस रुपए लिए ना है चुराए हैं आज चोरी की है कल न जाने क्या करेगा और अगर मैं इसकी मां की जगह होता ना तो दो दिन तक इसको खाना नहीं देता
बहु ठीक किया है तूने खाले appreciate that video as much as I did. I really love that video. My mother, my late mother was very strict. Of course, as a child, you could not understand this. But later on, as we matured in life, we began to realize. And of course, this video showed many things about Indian culture, the status of the daughters, of the daughter-in-law, etc. But here for the purpose of tonight's learning, for the purpose of the Buddha Dharma, it is a lesson in the precepts, which is the very foundation of our learning. Now, Dharma family, this is what we learn as teachers in university. But this is called the learning primitive. Hui Shan will be going to university soon. The universities of today, dear Dhamma family, is completely different from the universities that my generation attended or your self, your good selves attended. If I had a time machine that can bring things back and forth, and if I had to bring myself forward from 30 years ago, after I graduated and was teaching in UM, to the university today where I'm teaching, I will probably have a culture shock because it's completely different. And similarly, if I were to take a student today and bring him back in the time machine to 40 years ago when I was a university student, he or she will have a culture shock because it is so radically different. The world in education has changed completely. Now lecturers no longer lecture. Lectures are considered almost obsolete and an obscene word. Lecture halls do not serve a purpose anymore. Now students teach each other in small little groups, in small little tutorial rooms, whereby they teach in problem-based learning. And the lecturer is reduced now to a tutor sitting there, merely giving suggestions and guidelines and helping them to teach themselves by providing with them with a little bit of direction and a little bit of material if they are inexperienced. Students have what we call SDL, self-directed learning now. So the timetable is full of empty slots. When I was a student in the university, the timetable from Monday to Saturday morning is full. There's never an empty slot. But today, at least 25% of the timetable must be empty for self-directed learning. And now even the curriculum is student-directed. In the bad old days, lecturers evaluate students. In the modern era, the student evaluate the tutor. We have gone completely 180 degrees. Modern pedagogy has completely changed. Classrooms are now called flipped classrooms. No more somebody standing in the front on the blackboard. No more. Those days are historical. Now, this is the learning primitive. 
And part of the reason why this huge change in education came about is because they realized that if Huishan is to attend a lecture, sitting in a huge lecture hall like the old days in UM, she only retain or learn or maybe have a contribution to her education from the lecture of about 5%. The vast majority of the knowledge enters the left ear and exceeds the right. And the other important thing is knowledge has moved so fast that they say all lectures are redundant because by the time the student reads them, understand them, it's probably out of date. Something new has come on. So now students are taught to read instead. You do your own reading, your own research to teach your peers in a group of maybe 10 to 15 students. So the lecturer doesn't read and teach. The student reads and teach. Each assigned a separate section by their leader, not even by the tutor. The leader of the 15 students will divide. So each one will present maybe 10 minutes. And there is lots of audio visual now. They use lots of videos to help. And of course, as you go down the pyramid, you realize that discussion, demonstration are where they learn a lot. And finally, practice by doing. When you actually do it, and the most efficient way of learning is actually in teaching another person. Hence, I always say, in the two plus decades that I shared the Dhamma, I actually am the one who learned the most, who benefited the most. Now, do you realize that the Lord Buddha was so advanced in his pedagogy that he had utilized all this 2,600 years ago? You will notice a lot of question and answers in the way the Buddha teaches. You will notice that these words, you must reflect, you must discuss, you must contemplate, you must meditate. All these are used in his words. And he would get the students to discuss. And of course, we must practice what he taught us. The precepts, for example, is by practice. And if you keep practicing them, you become very good at them. Acts of metta, no amount of words, but practice, which I see Sakya In doing a fantastic job. And you again, you do that regularly, you're going to become very good at metta and acts of metta. And finally, teaching others. When you teach, you learn. So passive teaching methods are not very useful. Participatory teaching methods are far more effective. And you see the Buddha using these. There are ways in which he answered questions, which I'm sure are familiar to many of you. There are some questions that he think is not useful to be answered, and in fact, distracting, in which case he won't even bother to answer them, etc. So this learning primit, as we understand, has changed education, but we can see that the Buddha 2,600 years ago was already utilizing all this. And what we talked about in the practice of keeping precepts, the practice of metta, the acts of dana, all that is here. And finally, he wanted us to teach, to share, to beat the drum of the deathless. So I again want to remind everyone that the Buddha did not start any religion. In fact, if I again have a time machine and bring all of us back and we are looking at the Buddha in Northeast India 2,600 years ago, he will actually appear very much as anti-religion very much someone going against the mainstream of thought. Please look at this video and a teaching by the late Venerable Dhammananda. We have maturity.
we have sense of reasoning we have maturity we have sense of reasoning in our mind without misusing abusing without following anything blindly use your common sense my dear friend not necessary to have religious label whether we are buddhist or christian or hindus or muslim those labels are not important religion is not in their labels that is why the whole world today is a battlefield because of religion religious label not religious principles i want to introduce my religion egoism my religion our religion but not religion two religions introduce the same principles but one religion tried to convert this into the other religion but the same principle two labels so they are fighting for this label they bring religion into the battlefield to justify oh it is our religion they have polluted completely purity of religion they try to show worshiping praying so many times a day they are religious but they are cruelty anger jealousy grudge and ill will enmity all the evil forces are boiling in their mind where is religion what is the purpose of religion religion is for us to train our mind to live peacefully without harming without disturbing developing our what do you call harmony understanding and without violating the environment for others to suffer if these qualities are not in our religion there's no point of following any religion now there are free thinkers they never say they are buddhist or christians or muslim or hindus no label but do you think they behave as barbarians if you observe very carefully some of them are far better than those so called religious people who claim they are belong to this religion or that religion by knowing certain things are bad immoral harmful they try not to do that is understanding not because of god not because of punishment not because of hell knowing these things are wrong again <clears throat> they do lot of services for the well being of others to release other sufferings and troubles and problems and difficulties without expecting any reward from god they have no heaven no god no hell no rebirth no karma no soul nothing but they live as human being they so they keep away from bad thing they do lot of good thing without using any religious label why although they do not use any religious labels they practice religious principles without them we are belong to this religion religious principles are there therefore not necessary to say we are buddhist that word is not important the buddha was not a buddhist <laughs> jesus was not a christian we have given this label for them we must try to be good to do good as much as possible then we are very good religious people 
Okay, I hope that is very clear. Now, please shun as you learn the Buddha Dharma. You will realize as you learn more and more, as you read, as you contemplate, as you discuss, as you reflect, you will realize that the religious aspects which are created by people, it becomes less and less important. For many, these religious rituals, rites, aspects are important because it's a symbol that gives them comfort. It's a symbol of their devotion. And many people are still at that stage whereby they need to show devotion. They need to show, ah, I'm offering. They need to show, ah, I'm prostrating. As you learn the Buddha Dharma, you will realize that none of these is in the Buddha Dharma. The Buddha never asks us to prostrate or to offer all kinds of things. A sister this morning only was texting to me, saying how, oh, in this group, they will want the flowers arranged that way. The fruits of these various colors must be arranged that way. This light, this lamp, this whatever, all must be meticulously arranged in a certain manner. Yes, it shows devotion. It shows respect. But that can only help to a very superficial degree. And we have to go beyond that. And as you learn the Buddha Dharma, you will realize what the late Chief Venerable just taught us. Common sense, virtues, learning, applying, that is what we want because basically the Eightfold Path leads us to harmonious living on earth right now. It leads us on the gradual path to letting go, to realizing more and more until the final day where you can let go of everything. Someone, a brother text, is my desire to be enlightened another desire? Yes. Ultimately, even that desire to be whatever you want to be will be let go because you will realize anatta, non-self. When you realize anatta, non-self, there is no one to be enlightened. There is no one to enter Nibbana. But until then, it is difficult for someone to grasp that concept. As long as we haven't reached that stage, we live our life. Metta Karuna. Live together with Metta. And I will show you this, another wonderful video. We live in uncertain times. Wars are waged daily across borders, between nations, between nationalities, between people, between species, between us and them. Wars are waged daily within communities, within families, within ourselves. We live in uncertain times as we try to hold it all together so our families, our society, our economy, our beautiful earth and ourselves do not collapse. Often we look to our leaders, our social structures, our family and friends to help us hold it together without investigating into what is pulling us apart. Hate pulls us apart. Fear pulls us apart. Anger pulls us apart. Selfishness, otherness, carelessness pull us apart. 
until humanity has the courage and wisdom to look within each of us to see what is pulling us apart from our fellow brothers and sisters in this family of humanity, we will always live in uncertain times. To all my brothers and sisters who walk this beautiful earth with me, it is time to drop the illusion of separateness and the hubris of superiority. For in truth, we are all made from the same earth that upholds all of existence above it, the same water that fills our great ocean, the same heat that comes from the rays of the sun, the same air from the wind that blows throughout this world. It is time to drop the hate and anger that separates us to embrace that which binds us. And that is love. Love is the common language of humanity, spoken not by words, but in everyday actions. Love is our greatest teacher, so we learn to live not only for ourselves, but to live for the world in kindness and peace. Love is the balm that mends broken families, that recreates civil society, that fosters viable economy, that sustains this planet and heals our heart. So we may use our inner peace to create world peace in these uncertain times. all together so our fantasy, our beautiful earth and our earth dear Dhamma family that is the meta center and I'm so glad that Sakya In is doing so well and if you have watched this video very carefully you will have seen that love is in the little acts that we do every day, not in just verbalization. But I have repeatedly shared this, Meta is a work. And again, I said, I'm so happy to see our chair, our moderator, showing all the acts of Meta that Sakya In is doing. I think one act of Meta will represent the Buddha Dharma in its active form, so much more than us shouting our voice hoarse on Metta Karuna, love and compassion. None of it can even match a single act of Metta. Now, I want you to pay attention to this picture. Some years ago, I was in UK, in London, riding the underground. And you know, they make use of the walls on the other side of the tube. This side we stand on the other side of the tube. It used to be static posters in the old days, but nowadays they replace it all with LED TVs. And so they showed a picture like this, like what we are all looking at now. And then it says, isn't this beautiful? And everybody looks at it and agree and say, yes, it is beautiful. And then it asks a second question. Can you tell me why this is so beautiful? And of course, most of us are stunned. As I stood there looking at it, well, it's nature. That's all I can think of. And of course, following that, they tell you why it is so beautiful. It is so beautiful, Dhamma family, Dhamma brothers and sisters because there is not a single human being in this picture, not even one. Human beings have become so destructive that the instant we introduce a human being into the picture, it slowly, slowly, slowly becomes more and more destructive. And that whole thing, that whole lake will probably be reclaimed and condominiums built on top. So why have we become so destructive? Perhaps we need to go back and live our lives with metta, live our lives harmoniously 
as in the Eightfold Path, because that leads to harmonious living. Dear Dhamma family, the Buddha told us repeatedly six recollections. All right. These many of us do daily. We are familiar with this. We are familiar with virtue, sila, dana. All right. So we try our best to keep our precepts. We try our best to offer the dana of either material things or skill or time. Or in Sikhayin's case, in two weeks' time, we'll be broadcasting from the shrine hall of Sikhayin, the first in this series history. So that's a dana of a space for us to use to broadcast to the 13 centers all over Malaysia. And of course, the Devas. If we recall these constantly, I think we will certainly live a little bit better with more metta, more karuna. Let us, Dhamma family, take a look at what Ajahn Brahm taught us with regards to this. Whenever we do have any problems, we learn from them. Yes, we fall sometimes. We're not afraid of falling because falling is learning. We fall forward. Yes, we fail, but then we learn how to do it better. Isn't it a shame that we're always so concerned what other people think of us we become afraid, afraid of even talking to somebody and engaging with them just in conversation or helping them. Because of that fear of uncertainty, what would happen if I make a fool of myself? There's a nice little message in this. If you do make a fool of yourself and people laugh, well done. You've increased the happiness of the world. My answers stop further exploration. Have you ever noticed the longer you look, the more you see? If you think this is a water bottle, there's a right answer here somewhere. You stop looking. You stop investigating. You stop digging deeper. You stop innovating. Never allow your learning to stand in the way of truth. They're human beings, they're not perfect. One of the wonderful sayings is, no one is perfect, nobody is perfect. Hey dear Dhamma family, we will all walk as we learn. We try our best to keep our precepts. We try our best to do dana. We will discuss the Dhamma. We will contemplate ourselves. Nowadays, the material on the internet overwhelms us. We will reflect. We will share with Kayana Mitas. And as we walk, we will stumble every now and then. That's why we need Kayana Mitas to pick us up. And then we continue learning. We continue to improve, to live harmoniously. And basically, dear Dhamma family, as you walk this path, you will realize that you will become happier. This, the Buddha clearly taught us, is a path that you will be trodden with joy. As you walk, as you learn, as you learn to keep the precepts, as you learn to let go, you will actually be more and more happy. It is a path to be trodden with joy. And this path, as you walk, will be the fortunate, peaceful, and auspicious path. 
as you gain and acquire wisdom, as you learn not to be so attached, you will be happier. The little things that will make you very unjong and very unhappy will become less and less. And hopefully every one of you, my dear Dhamma family, will hold a placard like that and take a picture and post it for the whole world to see. I want to conclude by showing you why we can be successful as we walk this path of harmony. Success means individual carry some meaningful life, serve other as much as possible, at least uh, not harming other. That's a meaningful life, successful life. After all, our life span about 100 years. So that 100 years, she utilize, bring more smile, more friend. Uh, then that individual life, successful life. Individual life create more suspicion, more fear. That's not successful life. No matter rich or powerful. No. Even you, poor. You have plenty of friends. Friends with 100% trust. Uh, friendship entirely depends on trust. Trust very much depends on honest, truthful transparency. That related with sense of compassion, sense of respect for others' right. Then trust comes. Then you can, then you see, you can carry your life transparently. Nothing to hide. That brings trust. Trust is the basis of friendship. We are a social animal. We need friend. So therefore, the basis of friendship is trust. And I think survival of humanity, not technology, but ultimately, I think trust, friendship. So people, you see, who, uh, who have sort of these sort of value uh, become part of your life, then your life could be considered as a successful life. I feel that way. Dear Dhamma family, I think by now you will realize that Kalyana Mitas are very, very, very important. The Buddha said it's the whole of the spiritual life because they encourage us to keep to the path, to keep on going, to keep on doing good. And as you learn, as you walk this path, never underestimate the power, the contribution, the helpfulness of Kayana meters. I'm very blessed. I have a good group of Kayana meters in Johor Bahru. We try our best to be very close to each other in the sense that we text each other every morning. If somebody doesn't reply, that means big trouble. He's either sick or something wrong. And we contact him to find out. We try to eat regular meals together. And the reason why we are going over to a lecture in two weeks' time is because one of them is attending a Dhamma course there. And so the whole rest goes in support. And of course, to eat again together. So it is very important that you will need to learn in a group with Kayana meters until you are so strong, so mature that you can be alone. But until then, Huishan, even if you are in China, you will need Kayana meters. Now, Dhamma family, the age of believing is over. We are now in the age of knowing. Everything asks, why is it so? Never surrender your intellect. And I think this principle, it's a solid principle taught by the Buddha 2,000 years, 2,600 years ago. And you can see that the pedagogy of the Buddha 
is actually very, very advanced. 2,000 years ago, he, uh, 2,600 years ago, he already challenged people who merely believe on faith and challenge you to know for yourself. That, I think, it's very, very important. Because for the typical man in the street, many of them are not bothered about the truth. They just want reassurance that what they believe is the truth. And that's it. And that is why so many faiths are popular because it is so simplistic and just based purely on literally surrendering your interact to faith and dogma. I want to again take this opportunity here to thank the IT team who worked so hard to make sure this series runs smoothly. Even as we go to Malacca next week, they will, uh, two weeks time, they will continue to do it. And I want to thank Brother Ju Singh because for the last two years, he has been really acting as the manager, arranging all aspects of this series of talks. The only thing I do is to prepare my talks. And again, I want to repeat what we wish dear Dhamma family is to have wisdom. We do not want blind faith. We want wisdom. Wisdom that we can verify, that you can verify, that I can verify for yourself, by yourself. And then you will really have sada, not faith, but confidence that what the Buddha taught is truth, is reality. With that, no one can shake you. Because once you know you've got 10 fingers and 10 toes, no one can tell you otherwise. I want to end here and pass the sharing back to the moderator. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mr. Pinya Wong. We'll proceed with the Q&A. Uh, we have one question here from Brother Ko Wei Ken from PHBS. He asks, um, Ajahn Brahm said earlier, the longer you look, the more you see. Uh, how do we develop the curiosity to investigate mental and physical phenomena deeply? Sometimes the world appears to be mundane or boring. How do we find the motivation to look more closely? Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> Puna can give the opinion well, on this. And I cannot speak on Ajahn Brahm's behalf. <laughs> that will not yeah. be fair. But it's really up to you. Brother Tan Kim Shri has been active in the world of the Buddha Dharma for many, many decades. He is our Taikon. No? So it is almost like me asking Brother Tan Kim Sui, how do you develop this tenacity, this determination to continue on and on and on for so many years? So how do you develop this curiosity? Well, that's partly because I'm curious and you are curious and partly because I want to know and you want to know. So, for example, if someone who doesn't want to know, no matter how we share the Dhamma, is pointless. And that's, that's why there is a sutta called the Kesi Sutta, Brother Wunken, K-E-S-I. You can look it up. In that sutta, the Buddha is made to compare the training of you and me to someone who is an expert horse trainer. So the jits of the conversation is, oh, the expert horse trainer say, I've got very good horses that I can just train and they will be blah, blah, blah. Then there'll be some that needs to be really disciplined, blah, 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 before they will do it. And the bottom line, there will be some horses that are untrainable. They're simply not there. They don't have it. They simply do not want it to be trained. And the Buddha replied that even within 
the world of the people who are here who may want to learn the Buddha Dharma. We have some who are all you need, like Yin Ling, a small little push. And she's way beyond me. Way beyond what many of us who have practiced for years. And you have some whom you literally drag, like the Chinese say, a cow up a tree, you know. And then there are others who are simply untrainable. They're simply not interested. So we are all different. We are all different. And in another sutta, the Buddha looked at it in comparison to patients. Some patients you give medicine, they will get cured. Some patients, even though you give or don't give, also they will get cured. While for some, no matter what you do, they will die. So for that, we make them as comfortable as possible. Metta, karuna. But it's the same thing. How do you develop your curiosity? Well, I can't force you to develop your curiosity. Only you can say, I want to investigate. You know, that's one of the factors of enlightenment. Right? So if you have no wish to investigate, you just pray to a hamburger. Well, that's about it now. You will remain eating hamburgers. Huh? So investigation is something very important, as you know as the factor of enlightenment. So if you say, I want to improve myself, I want to be like Brother Kim Shi, then you're inspired by Brother Kim Shi. And so that's by imitation. You say, oh, Brother Kim Shi is doing good work. I can do it for Putra Heights. So I say, I will be the future Kim Shi of Putra Heights. That's by imitation. And then, of course, by reflection. The more you learn, the more profound you find, the more answers you find. And of course, if you have a good group of people, you live in metta. Unfortunately, I have to admit that metta is not a common commodity. Eh? Many people mouth it, but you hardly see it in action. So if you do see it in action, stick with it. These are good people. And the last one, the most bitter when you have a personal tragedy, when you are forced to face it, and then you will ask why. You know, we have young people struck with illnesses, why they ask. And of course, it could be the other way, it could be something very happy either. And the very happy can also turn, can have a very nice job, very nice, but lousy colleagues. Why see versa? So these are things that will make you investigate and ask why. No one else can put that into your mind. It is up to you whether you wish to investigate. Remember, remind yourself, investigation is one of the factors of enlightenment. You need that. Thank you. Hello, brother. Yes. Okay, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I couldn't unmute earlier. All right. Thanks, Dr. Punya, for the response on the questions. So I did a bit of recap, eh? recap on the talk earlier. The key messages that you have been highlighted during your talk is about on use mind and wisdom and basically to avoid intellectual suicide, as you mentioned. And when you teach, basically, you also learn, learn how to improve. And quite interesting that you uh, list out the six subjects of reco recollections earlier about Tathagata, uh, Dhamma, uh, Sangha, one virtuous behavior, one generosity, and deities. And of course, uh, learn how to do better. So for on this note, perhaps uh, you can provide some closing remarks from the overalls uh, your talk about the learning today. Yeah. So okay, uh, Dr. Punya, what are your closing remarks? On closing your... remarks? Yeah will be what I started with, mm. how to acquire wisdom. And I think this is very true. By reflection, which in our manner, contemplation, meditation, on discussion with your friends, that's the noblest. By imitation, 
following the Buddha, when you, every time you prostrate to the Buddha image, every time you prostrate, you say, those are the qualities I want to emulate. Every time you bow down to whichever Bodhisattva image, those are the qualities that I want to be. And finally, in all the life experiences that you and I go through, you can actually tie it to the Buddha Dhamma. Whether good or bad, happy or sad, you can actually see it. Even the happiest moments will pass. Everything is not permanent. You don't even know what's going to happen to Malacca tomorrow. That tells you how impermanent permanence is. So everything in life you will find is flowing like a stream. And because it is always changing, nothing in life, because of its nature of change, will be what you will want it to be. It's going to give you dissatisfaction by its very characteristic that it is always changing. It is unreliable. It is unstable. So how can that give you a state whereby you're always satisfied? And finally, you will realize that all this is because it is not self. It is empty. There is no core to it. Everything is cause, condition, and effect. And that is the, really the core teaching of the Buddha. And when we demand that it be otherwise, that's when you have to come. Dukkha arises when you demand that it be otherwise and not accepting or facing reality. So facing reality is our next stop from Sakya Inn. So we will talk about that later. Thank you. Okay.